Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be. It's great you could all be here today. My name is Nigel Corey. I'm the Associate Director for Trade Policy here at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF. It's my great pleasure to moderate uh, today's event with such a set of distinguished experts and practitioners from around the world to talk about how countries uh, support data flows, digital trade and good data governance. There's rarely a day that goes by when there isn't a story, a policy debate about an issue involving global data governance or lack thereof, an analysis of points of cooperation, tension and conflict between countries' respective responses. But before we dive into the issues, let me provide a brief overview of today's run of show. First, we'll hear from Jason Oxman, the President and CEO of the Information Technology Industry Council for brief overview remarks. ITI is a global trade association representing some of the world's most innovative companies. So they're in a position to take a similarly global view as I do in the report in considering the ever-changing regulatory environment for data around the world and the impact this has on digital trade. Second, we'll hear from today's keynote speaker, Minister John Whittingdale, the United Kingdom's Minister of State for Media and Data. I'm particularly thankful to the minister who took time out of his no doubt busy schedule to participate in today's event. I think the UK perspective in a, is an especially interesting one at the moment, given their ongoing work to define and prosecute their own data and digital trade strategy post-Brexit. And then third, we'll shift to the main panel. I'll provide an overview of the report, which ITIF published yesterday and key findings. And then we'll hear from Alex Greenstein, Amy Murray and Ito Satanori, who I'll provide a, a, an introduction to when we move to the panel. After that, we'll open it up to Q&A. So we wanna hear from you. So uh, please submit your questions via the ITIF event page or via the YouTube stream. Uh, you can also upvote questions that you want asked and we'll get to these in the Q&A Q session at the end. And with that, I wanna invite Jason to set the scene for us. Jason. Thanks, Nigel. And thank you for the terrific work that has gone into this report. Looking forward to hearing more about your findings today. We are grateful to you and your colleagues at the foundation for the phenomenal work that you do day in and day out to help us analyze, research, and discuss important technology policy issues at the intersection of innovation and the economy. As the trade association of the technology industry, we at ITI are pleased to have had the opportunity to support the development of this timely report. The issues related to data flows, data localization, data governance, and digital trade are core not only to ITI's member companies, but quite literally to businesses in every sector of the economy. Among the many lessons that we learned during the pandemic, one of the clearest is that digital technologies, data, and the internet are essential for the global economy to function, even and especially during times of uncertainty, crisis, and change. The pandemic has really accelerated the adoption and use of digital technologies uh, across all aspects of our lives, from working remotely, learning remotely, access to critical services, and much more. As a clear demonstration of the broad-based benefits of digital trade, recent studies estimate that about 75% of the value added by data flows on the internet accrues to traditional businesses, especially via increases in growth, productivity, and employment. So this is an issue for more than just the technology industry. It's an issue for all industries. One in three small and medium-sized enterprises report that their businesses would not have survived in the pandemic without access to digital tools. And over 60% of small businesses say that technology has helped them overcome barriers to exporting their products and services. But as the report we're gonna discuss today highlights, data localization measures threaten to constrain digital trade by restricting businesses' access to data services. Data localization measures are expanding around the globe at a very worrying rate, more than doubling in the last four years. Some governments, large governments and small governments alike, are developing a digital policy approach that detrimentally impacts the global innovation ecosystem. 
and restricts the ability of businesses, workers, and consumers to deploy and make use of digital products and services across borders. Fortunately, alongside this worrying trend, there are a wide range of efforts underway that seek to facilitate international compatibility in the digital policy space. Governments, both individually and in various international forums, are innovating and advancing transparent and non-discriminatory mechanisms for the cross-border transfer of trade. These are an essential component to ensuring the global economy can function while also providing assurance to any user of digital services or connected devices that their information is safe and secure. Now, digital trade commitments, such as those enabling cross-border trade of data, data flows, and prohibiting data localization, are also key tools to countering these negative trends and in developing norms around digital policy that create certainty for global business. We at ITI support international efforts, including those driven by some of the government representatives participating in today's event, to broaden the acceptance of strong, state-of-the-art digital rules. The work of the foundation that we're going to discuss today underscores that digital protectionism is increasingly damaging on a local and global scale, and it can be advanced under many guises. ITI therefore looks forward to continuing our partnership with governments that want to advance new rules, principles, and policies that ensure that regulatory and digital policy approaches are transparent, risk-based, non-discriminatory, and grounded in international standards. Beyond digital trade, global work and collaboration on tough digital issues, such as the ongoing discussions at the OECD on cross-border law enforcement access to data, and the bilateral US-EU efforts to discuss a successor to Privacy Shield are all essential to fostering a global digital ecosystem. So again, our sincere thanks to the Foundation for the important research and thought leadership on global data policy issues. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I look forward to the Minister's remarks and to our important panel discussion. And we also look forward to supporting future work on this important set of issues. And with that, Nigel, back to you. Thanks, Jason. Really appreciate those remarks. Your point about just how critical digital tools have become for firms of all sizes in all sectors during COVID is, is, is one that uh, particularly rings true. Now, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Minister Whittingdale, who was kind enough to pre-record his key keynote remarks. I would like to thank the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation for your invitation to speak to you today. I'm delighted to be able to address such a distinguished and international audience. This is an exciting time for the UK and for me as the Minister for Data. Now that the UK is no longer an EU member state and is an independent sovereign nation once more, we now have control of our own laws on data and this includes giving us the ability to make creative and pragmatic use of these in relation to international data transfers. I firmly believe that this will benefit both the UK and the global community. Given the fragmented nature of global data policy, the UK has the opportunity to show creative leadership and influence to help to promote the development of international rules. The importance of international data transfers will be well known to this audience. Quite simply, data transfers have revolutionised our way of life and global economies. Data transfers underpin exciting opportunities for innovation, collaboration and trade, especially in scientific research, financial services and artificial intelligence. In 2018, the UK exported £190 billion in services delivered digitally and in 2019, investments in the UK tech sector soared to £10.1 billion, a £3.1 billion increase on 2018 figures and the highest level in UK history. All of this is underpinned by data transfers. 
there are great opportunities to be seized on data transfers and there are also great challenges that need addressing. In doing so, the UK will be a leader in shaping global thinking and promote the benefits of a secure international exchange of data. This will be integral to global recovery and future growth and prosperity. I'd like to begin by covering our plans and ambitions on the most well-known and straightforward mechanism for organisations, adequacy. I'll then set out our plans on alternative transfer mechanisms, recognising that adequacy is one tool in our toolbooks for data transfers. We have spent the past few years designing and implementing our independent policies and processes for striking UK adequacy agreements. We remain steadfast in our commitment to high data protection standards. We recognise and understand the cultural context of privacy and the global variety in exactly how countries regulate privacy. No two countries will have the same data protection framework. Adequacy and our process for adequacy do not require countries to have identical laws to the UK. At the moment, Adequacy takes too long, and the list of adequate countries is too small. A more open and creative approach will unlock the ability to significantly increase the number of adequate countries. Our flexible approach to adequacy extends to striking arrangements with critically important sectors or parts of a country's economy that have high data protection standards. How we decide which opportunities to prioritise will be based on a number of policy factors, including our trade and diplomatic relationships and our initial view on the strength of that country's data protection rules. Through the National Data Strategy, we consulted where the public would like us to concentrate our efforts and we've been reflecting on those responses in our work. Our list of priority destinations for adequacy is ambitious and diverse. Priorities span the globe and reflect the scale of the opportunity. Our near-term priorities range from Australia to Colombia, from South Korea to the Dubai International Finance Centre, and from Singapore to, of course, the United States. Longer term, there are opportunities to partner with countries earlier in the design and implementation of data privacy rules, like India, Brazil and Kenya. In an increasingly complex global data ecosystem, where businesses and organisations routinely transfer around the world, adequacy may not always be the right tool for the job. We have a number of alternative transfer mechanisms or transfer tools in our toolkit to ensure UK data is appropriately protected when it is transferred outside of the UK. We believe there is flexibility within this toolkit to facilitate transfers for organisations in the private and public sectors. The ICO will launch a consultation on new UK standard data protection clauses, termed international data transfer agreements and associated guidance later this month. We're also working to develop our toolkit to improve the use of underutilized mechanisms, such as certifications and codes of conduct. We want to remove unnecessary bureaucracy in the system by focusing on getting the right outcomes for data protection. There is a great opportunity to exploit a more flexible approach to create a more globally interoperable model for data protection that works in harmony with other privacy systems. And we're using our international influence and role in multilateral fora like the G7 and G20 to drive forward global solutions to the challenges and barriers impeding cross-border data flows. For example, by using our G7 presidency to achieve consensus to a roadmap on data-free flow with trust. Our ambition is to implement an adequacy capability that is creative and agile so that we can rise to the scale of the global opportunity. 
All that I've set out reflects how we're utilising our new independent powers. We should also use the opportunity of being outside the EU to look at how we can improve our data laws. The UK now controls its own data protection laws and regulations. We want our data regime to remain fit for purpose and to support the future objectives of the UK. We will continue to operate a high quality regime that promotes growth and innovation and underpins the trustworthy use of data. When it comes to considering any future reform, we will remain committed to the approach on international data transfers I've set out today. We will want to leverage our experience to inform how we can improve our current capabilities. And I'll conclude by saying the UK has a unique opportunity to be a global leader on international data transfer issues. We also have the opportunity to build data bridges with our partners through collaboration and the pursuit of a flexible outcomes-based approach. We can, we should, and we must remove or reduce the data transfer barriers that stymie commerce, innovation, science, law enforcement, and security. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you will enjoy the discussions. Uh uh, thanks for that again to uh, thank you, Minister Whittingdale, for those remarks. Really interesting. A lot to unpack there uh, uh, relates to many issues in the report and in the discussion. Uh, also flagging a number of changes that we'll obviously all need to keep an eye on in the coming weeks. Um, shifting to the panel. It's my great pleasure to moderate a discussion from such a distinguished set of experts and practic pra practitioners who are at the table negotiating and, and working with counterparts on these issues. Um, after I provide my report overview, we'll have Alex Greenstein, the Director of Privacy Shield Negotiations at the US Department of Commerce. Uh, beyond Privacy Shield, Alex and the team at the Department of Commerce are also involved in discussions about government access to data at the OECD and data governance issues in the Asia Pacific in APEC, among uh, uh, data governance issues elsewhere around the world. We'll then hear from my friend, Amy Stewart, who is the director of the WTO Digital Trade Section at Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, she and her team are involved in negotiations at the WTO and the Asia Pacific. Amy deserves special credit and recognition uh, given how late it is in Australia at the moment. Then we'll hear from Ito Satanori, who's special advisor and director of Japan's uh, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry and the Japan External Trade Organization in New York. He was a key contributor to Japanese former Prime Minister Abe's concept of data free flow of trust. He's now in the United States covering uh, geotech issues. After that, we'll have time for Q&A. So again, if you have any questions, please uh, uh, send them through via the ITI event page or the YouTube uh, uh, site. So, with that, I will now um, give everyone an overview of my uh, uh, report, which is available on the ITIF website. Um, firstly, uh, I'd like to thank my co-author, Luke Descoli, for all the hard work he put in uh, to the econometric modeling and the data visuals. You can see all these and all the other details I'm about to talk about in the report on the ITIF webpage. Uh, I, the first point I wanna make is, is the clearest one. Data will flow across borders unless governments enact restrictions. Let, let me by, start by making the equally clear point that countries should create obviously robust data privacy and governance frameworks that protect consumers and address national security concerns. But policymakers should do so in a transparent, targeted and balanced way um, uh, to avoid unnecessarily restrictive policies given the economic and trade impact. Many common data protection laws, such as those based on the OECD privacy principles, are not a restriction on digital trade and adherence to them is just a normal cost of doing business. And while many countries allow data to flow easily around the world, recognizing that legal protections can accompany data, many more have enacted new barriers to data transfers that make it more expensive and time consuming, if not illegal, to transfer data overseas. So, uh, forced local data residency requirements that confine data within a country's borders, a concept known as data localization, 
have evolved and spread in the four years since I last took a sort of deep dive look into the issue. The spread of data localization to more countries and more data types poses a growing threat to the potential for an open rules-based and innovative global digital economy. Data localization makes the internet less accessible and secure, more costly and complicated, and less innovative. Businesses use data to create value, and many can only maximize the value of that data when it can flow freely across borders. The false promise of data nationalism is clear in the simple fact that the value of data comes from how it's used, not where it's stored. Next slide. I'd I encourage everyone to head to our interactive data visualization page to check out the spread of data localization policies around the world. The appendix of the report contains a full detailed list uh, as well. But the overarching trend is troublingly clear. The number of data localization policies in force around the world has more than doubled in the last four years. In 2017, when I last looked at the issue, we counted 35 countries that had a, an implemented 67 uh, such barriers. Next slide, please. Now we have 62 countries that have imposed 144 restrictions and dozens more are under consideration. As you can see, personal data is among the most popular types of targeted uh, categories of data, but it's far from alone with financial and payments data, government data, genomic and health data, as more and more countries use data localization to, to take a targeted granular approach to a, a broader range of data. Now, not all data localization measures are the same. There are explicit restrictions targeting specific types of data. Countries are also increasingly restricting data in broad uh, and vague categories deemed sensitive or important or related to national security. Then there's also de facto localization. By making data transfer so complicated, costly and uncertain, firms basically have no choice but to store data locally, especially in the face of potentially massive fines. The EU's general data protection regulation is the clearest example. Next slide. Justifications for data localization have also evolved since 2017. Some policymakers still inadvertently support localization as they don't understand how firms manage data on a global basis while complying with local laws. However, many more policymakers openly support localization, although they'll use mixed motivations to try and justify it. I'll briefly explain the five main motivations I outlined in the report. Firstly, there are misguided data privacy, protection and cybersecurity concerns. As more countries update data protection frameworks, it's nearly inevitable that some policymakers propose data localization as they automatically and mistakenly believe that the best way to protect data is to store it within a country's borders. This is mistaken for several reasons. One being that policymakers misunderstand the confidentiality of data does not depend on which country the information is stored in, but rather the measures used to store it securely. Secondly, in the last four years, we've seen data sovereignty subsume digital protectionism as a leading motivator. Policymakers commonly portray cyber sovereignty or data sovereignty as a strong yet nebulous concept, usually referring to the assertion of state control over data. Proponents think that forcing firms to store data locally enhances the state's agency and that of their own firms and people. At best, the agency gained is imaginary. In many cases, it's counterproductive. And in the case of authoritarian countries, it's predatory, given the agency's data localization support are those involved in surveillance and political control, which leads to the third motivation, the use of localization as a tool to, by mainly authoritarian governments led by China and Russia, but followed by Pakistan, Vietnam and Turkey, who see physical access to data as a critical enabler of surveillance and political control. Fourth, countries continue to use law enforcement and regulatory concerns, especially from financial regulators about cross-border access to data. This re uh, reflects the mistaken belief that firms can somehow avoid oversight and requests for data by simply transferring data out of the country. Fifth and final is that countries use localization in preparation for largely hypothetical and incredibly unlikely international financial sanctions. Russia obviously provides a model for this, but Mexico, South Africa, Vietnam and others have cited their case. Next slide. Moving on to the model. While our econometric analysis provides only an indicative estimate of the economic impact, given challenges with measurement and specificity, it is still important to do to reinforce to policymakers the negative effects of restrictions have and what they have on data flows. ITIF's model calculates a composite index, the data restrictiveness linkage, 
to estimate the linkage of downstream industries with national data restrictiveness based on the data intensity of those industries. We examine the impact that changes in data restrictions have on total factor productivity, value added prices, and gross output volumes. All these coefficient estimates in our model are statistically significant. The report has all the detailed uh, explanation about the methodology in the report. Uh, the core components of the model are drawn from the 28 mainly developed countries with the necessary data in the OECD and EU CLEMS database, but they can be applied to other countries as they are representative estimates of data usage and the effect of restrictions. As the underlying data is reported every five years, our econometric model provides an indicative estimate of the cumulative effect over five years. Next slide. The econometric modeling estimates that a one unit increase in a country's data restrictiveness index results in a 7% decrease in its volume of gross output traded, a 1.5% increase in the prices of goods and services among downstream industries, and a 2.9% decrease in productivity over a five year period. Intuitively, this makes sense in that restrictions on data lead to higher prices for data services in downstream industries, and that ultimately these impacts detract from economic productivity given data is now a key input alongside labor and capital. Next slide. Specifically, in the case of China, Indonesia, Russia, and South Africa, the model and the list of data localization measures we categorize in a report align in showing they've become more restrictive and that over a five year period, data restrictiveness reduces the gross output in trade. It reduces productivity while increasing prices. Next slide, please. After working on digital trade and data governance issues for some time, it's very easy for me to get pessimistic about where we're heading, but there is some progress being made that can be built upon in constructing better alternatives to data localization and data protect digital protectionism. Former Japanese Prime Minister Abe deserves credit for putting many of these issues on the global agenda with his concept for data free flow of trust. Again, I'd point you to the report to read the extensive range of general specific recommendations. I'll briefly explain some here. First, Policymakers should put the concept of interoperability, as the minister mentioned, at the center of efforts to develop rules for the global digital economy. Interoperability means that countries enact laws to address data privacy, cybersecurity, and other issues uh, in broadly similar ways so that they each provide a similar level of protection or similarly address a shared objective, even if the specific legal and regulatory frameworks differ. Let me be clear, the EU's approach via adequacy determinations is not interoperability. Its approach is based on harmonization. It wants every country to adopt, adopt GDPR, which is simply untenable and unrealistic. Interoperability is a far more realistic goal for global data governance. It accounts for the fact that countries have differing legal, political, social values and systems, and that there's no one law for any specific data related issue. What interoperability looks like in practice depends on the sector and the issue and the policy concern. Please see the report for all the other details. Second, Australia, Japan, Singapore, the US, the UK and others should pursue new digital economy agreements and mechanisms for cooperation. Digital economy agreements combine legally binding and enforceable commitments on data flows with soft commitments to cooperate on regulatory, emerging regulatory issues, often via MOUs. Thus, they can adjust to the changing nature of trade, technology and regulation. They proactively bring domestic regulatory agencies into trade discussions when they're only starting to think about new rules for digital issues. Traditional comprehensive trade agreements and WTO trade rules just can't keep up. The Chile, New Zealand, Singapore Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, DEPA, and its modular structure for its various issues like AI and data flows and open data and fintech are a great example that is open to other similarly ambitious countries to work together in a flexible way to create new rules. These initiatives can then form the foundation for broader debate, ad adaptation and adoption, much like the core four countries who are at the heart of what eventually became the CPTPP trade agreement. Likewise, the Australia-Singapore Digital Economy Agreement and its similar pursuit of joint pilot projects and studies and MOUs on e-identity issues, digital standards and e-invoicing issues. Third, Australia, Japan, the US and others should open APEX cross-border privacy rules, CBPR, to make it a global data governance framework. CBPR is an accountability-based mechanism that facilitates privacy respecting data flows. At the moment, it's only open to APEC member economies, of which eight have joined. 
a global CBPR would be attractive to governments as it focuses on core principles and accountability, recognising that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Fourth, a small group of like-minded, value-sharing democratic countries should work together to develop what we call a Geneva Convention on Data to establish common principles, processes and safeguards to government access to data. Discussions at the G7 and OECD provide a tightrope opportunity for countries to develop a common framework on this critical issue. Next slide. In terms of sectoral issues, um, there's opportunities for countries to work together to develop clear frameworks to help facilitate the reasonable, responsible and ethical sharing of health data to support health research. Likewise, there's uh, an important need for uh, uh, the US and Australia and others to help advocate for financial data governance frameworks that focus on access to data rather than where it's stored. Next slide, please. Finally, but not least, countries need to improve the process by which uh, law enforcement agencies request data for investigations. The system needs improving. As a former diplomat that has managed these, I can tell you that existing legal processes and treaties are out of date, needlessly complex, and often delayed due to poorly resourced local agencies. The US Cloud Act agreements are a great example of the new types of tools we need to address what is a legitimate issue. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the trend line of data localization is clear and is set to continue. If countries want to ensure the internet remains open and innovative, they will really need to step up their game, bring the agencies and the issues out of their respective silos and to bring them all together to figure out what's the best overall approach and strategy to address each of these related issues. Given its importance, it's astounding to me that the United States and others don't have a grand strategy for the global digital economy. It's equally amazing that the US isn't a key driver of digital trade negotiations in the Asia Pacific. It's clearly in the US interest. Meanwhile, digital scoff laws like China and Russia continue to build an alternative model based on digital control and protectionism. However, ultimately, the success or failure of efforts by countries that recognize the value of an open global digital economy will depend on their effort to engage and help the many swing states that have not chosen one path or model over the other. And I'll end it there and hand it across to Alex. No, thank you very much, Nigel. And that was a great presentation. And it was very uh, good to see some really rigorous work being done sort of in this area, because I mean, some of the uh, econometric modeling there was, um, was quite helpful in terms of illustrating sort of what is exactly at stake right now. But yeah, let me say thanks again to Nigel and the ITAF for having me here today. Um, it's my pleasure to sort of talk with you all a little bit about what the US government is doing to support data flows, and as well as the current state of transatlantic data flows and the privacy shield negotiations, and how we're working to bring uh, greater clarity to uh, data transfers uh, following the uh, European Court of Justice's Schrems II ruling um, that brought a great deal of uncertainty into this uh, area. So yeah, I work at the Commerce Department uh, for the United States, and I um, manage the EU, US, and Swiss, US privacy shield frameworks. Uh, both frameworks were designed um, by Commerce and the US government and negotiated with the European Commission and the Swiss administration to provide companies um, a reliable mechanism to comply with data protection requirements in Europe and allow them to transfer data from the European Union and Switzerland, respectively, to the United States. Um, these data transfers are incredibly important to the transatlantic relationship, and that sort of is why the um, Schrems II case and the invalidation of the European Commission's adequacy determination for Privacy Shield were so um, impactful in a negative manner on sort of um, the transatlantic economy and sort of all the for all the reasons that sort of Nigel laid out in his report. I mean, this is vital to not just sort of big tech firms, but uh, any company anymore. I mean, the sort of aphorism that um, all companies are digital is increasingly, uh, it's hard to do things without transferring data. Um, and then also the other sort of aspect of this is that the um, decision in the Schrems II case, while it was narrowly focused on sort of a Privacy Shield has also brought into question the viability of using other transfer mechanisms from Europe to the United States and other third countries, such as the uh, standard contractual clauses, 
binding corporate rules and other um, means for transferring data. And just sort of returning to that point that this is sort of important for not just sort of major tech firms, but for all companies and all types of transatlantic commerce. Um, it's significant that Privacy Shield, um, around 70, 75% of our companies are SMEs, which, um, and so Privacy Shield provided an expedited means for them to uh, comply with EU data transfer requirements. So in this sort of uncertain environment, I mean, the United States is working very closely with sort of our partners in the European Commission to negotiate an enhanced Privacy Shield framework. Um, that fully addresses the European Court of Justice's concerns in TREMS 2 and will enable Privacy Shield to once again serve as a transfer mechanism for um, uh, EU personal data coming to the United States. And I think this is also ties in with sort of some of the things that Nigel was talking about in terms of like-minded countries coming together because I think this is sort of, ultimately this is part of sort of the ongoing efforts to sort of revitalize the EU-US partnership and sort of um, enhancing transatlantic relations that have um, lagged in sort of the previous years. And also, this is also enables us to focus on our shared values. I mean, because ultimately the United States and Europe are not that far apart on privacy. And while we have different legal systems and our technical approaches are different, our values are fundamentally the same. And so that sort of is something that underpins um, everything that we are doing. And so it's important to sort of focus on that, that actually sort of the United States and Europe are very close on privacy and we both recognize that there are appropriate safeguards on government access to data. And that stands in sharp contrast to um, the lack of those types of um, safeguards in authoritarian countries. And, but, um, but we are sort of, we, our focus on the need for a quick resolution to this, and we are trying to negotiate a deal as quickly as possible. Um, but we also need to make sure that this is um, legally defensible, because certainly, like, and we do not wish this to um, fall to another legal challenge. And so we're focused on really substantively addressing the um, concerns raised by the European Court of Justice. Um, I can't go into details on sort of the content of the negotiations right now, um, but it is an issue of urgency and that we are sort of very much focused on um, getting this done quickly to re return stability to transatlantic commerce. Um, I would also sort of note that there is a high level of support from sort of the leadership in the United States and in the um, European Union on this. Um, it's a top priority for the Biden administration here in the United States is um, finalizing this updated privacy shield. And uh, Commerce Secretary Raimondo has been very much actively engaged in this issue. Uh, this was discussed during the recent uh, US-EU summit. Um, Secretary Raimondo had uh, a number of meetings with her counterparts there, including Commissioner Renders, uh, for Justice and Vice President Yarova. And then also it's worth noting that this was referenced in the US-EU summit statement, which includes sort of a commitment from um, the United States and Europe to uh, work together to uh, ensure safe, secure, and trusted cross-border data flows. Um, and so that sort of underscores the fact that sort of we do have high level political support for this, but we have to do the necessary work to make sure that this deal is um, very much substantive and fully addresses the court's concerns. And this also sort of does follow and sort of like, you know, is a part of sort of the broader US government approach to sort of data transfers. And um, that includes sort of other elements such as sort of the APEC CBPRs and transfers and sort of other um, uh, to the rest of the world. And then finally, sort of also note that sort of, yes, I mean, certainly the OECD process, which was also referenced, is a very important uh, development and one that we sort of support as well. But I think I've gone on for uh, perhaps a little bit too long. So let me uh, turn it over to the other colleagues who would like to keep some time for uh, questions and answers. Thanks.
No worries. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I, I know we've got a few questions uh, lined up for you uh, for the Q&A, uh, but we'll move on uh, to my good friend Amy in Australia uh, to provide us uh, with her view on all of these things uh, from the Australian perspective. So over to you, Amy. Thanks very much, Nigel. And thanks very much uh, for having me today and, and for the excellent report. Um, I've been negotiating these trade rules for many years now, and this level of sort of granularity and substance on the policy issues, I think, will be that's in your report will be very useful for practitioners, policymakers, and negotiators working on this rapidly changing agenda. Uh, so, for my remarks today, I wanted to draw out some of the themes of the report and how we see them as being relevant to our trade negotiations. But I was also interested in the part of the report that talks about how obstructing data flows also undermines the potential for cooperation on data governance issues. Um, so, of course, these issues are really critical to a comprehensive digital trade policy framework, and I'd like to touch on some of those in my remarks as well. So firstly, looking at how we try to, Australia tries to address some of the issues raised in the report through our trade rules. As a country dependent on trade, Australia has a, an interest in setting really strong digital trade rules that can provide a counterweight to rising protectionism and which support a free, open and secure internet. And of course, this is all taking place in a dynamic and quickly evolving area of trade where countries are rapidly changing their measures um, consistently across the world. So where we do establish rules, um, it's really important that they can stand the test of time. And that's not always an easy process as it requires predicting how digital trade policies will evolve. So Australia's approach here to trade rules is, to, is based on a couple of principles. Um, firstly, shaping and enabling an international environment for digital trade that balances the protection of consumers and privacy with the facilitation of trade and investment. Um, and here's where the concept in your um, recommendations, Nigel, of interoperability comes in because we certainly don't seek to only agree trade rules with partners that have the same regulatory approach as us. We, we couldn't do that in our region. Um, it's quite a different, quite different regulatory settings across the region. But what we're looking to do is shape that enabling environment so um, that the two systems can work together with the appropriate protections to maximise trade and investment. Um, and then the second principle that we really look to is to develop international trade rules based on the broad principles of non-discrimination and technological neutrality. So Australia has included digital trade rules in 14 of our 16 concluded FTAs. And we've recently finalised, um, as, as you noted in your presentation, negotiations of the Australia-Singapore Digital Economy Agreement and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. And we're currently negotiating digital trade rules bilaterally with the EU and the UK. Australia is also co-convener with Japan and Singapore of negotiations on global digital trade rules in the WTO through a joint statement initiative. And my team leads on those negotiations. So um, what, what kind of, when we talk about digital trade rules, you know, how, how, how do these rules address data? So since TPP, which was really the start of our um, data rules practice, we've included two key rules. Um, one, enabling the cross-border flow of data for business, and another one, prohibiting unnecessary data localization requirements that, as the report notes, can really be hidden forms of protectionism and introduce high costs to business. Of course, these rules are not the same in all of our agreements. In some of our more recent FTAs, we've applied the data rules to financial services, which was previously a very sensitive sector for many countries. But the basic package of rules, I think, is really starting to gain traction globally. The OECD Digital Trade Inventory states that 72 jurisdictions or 55 JSI participants have signed trade, digital trade agreements, signed trade agreements, including rules on cross-border data flows. And I mentioned this, of course, not to declare problems solved, but to highlight that while the report notes the protectionist measures are increasing, simultaneously the number of jurisdictions recognising this as a problem and agreeing to binding rules is also increasing. And of course, there's always a regulatory lag once we try to address these things through binding rules. And this is all before we, we try to conclude a set of global rules in the WTO. So I think that um, some of the commercial effects of these kinds of um, data protectionism policies are, are really well laid out in your report, Nigel. But I just wanted to touch on, um, as some of the other speakers have, you know, what that means for essentially the digital divide and the distribution of those economic um, those economic problems or the economic restrictions. 
So, you know, obviously, as um, some of, I think Jason mentioned, um, there's, there's a lot of evidence of the increasingly central role of the digital economy during the pandemic. And I think he referred to some of the statistics that Google has put together in terms of businesses relying on new markets during the pandemic to replace business loss. We also had some great um, webinars recently in Geneva showing examples of, for example, medical specialists providing cross-border telehealth consultations to remote communities that had reduced services during the pandemic. Um, it's really been um, evident in the statistics, but also I think anecdotally in all of our lives, we can see um, businesses and consumers really increasingly relying on the digital economy during COVID. Um, navigating the complexity of the global digital economy, though, can be challenging for any enterprise, but the Googles and Facebooks of the world with an army of lawyers and public policy officials are pretty well positioned to have conversations with China about what their new measures, um, what's necessary to get approvals for transfer and these sort of broad brush measures, um, what that involves. But for SMEs with limited resources, certainly I hear from Australian stakeholders that, that, can, that navigating complex data regulations around the globe can sometimes be an insurmountable obstacle to accessing new markets. And some of the other speakers spoke about what this means for SMEs. And as we know, women and other underrepresented groups have a stronger representation in small and micro businesses and self-employed businesses. And in my part of the world, I recently did a posting to the Australian mission to ASEAN. In ASEAN, SMEs are a crucial part of the energy of that economy across the whole region. So, you know, Australia's focus when we think about these rules is really what digital trade restrictions means and, and who disproportionately feels that. It's usually people that were already um, experiencing a digital divide. And that has implications not only for businesses um, and small businesses, but for the rights of consumers and for the workers of those small businesses. So that's some of the sort of, um, I think, less understood um, economic consequences um, of data restrictions. I also just wanted to briefly touch on the parts of your report, Nigel, that talk about the social and political consequences of some of the more extreme forms of digital protectionism. You know, what a government essentially does when they prevent data from leaving and try to control all platforms locally is they move the internet um, across the spectrum from being a public good closer to being a government resource. And as you noted, authoritarian regimes are increasingly using technology and digital policy to extend their global influence and utilize the private data of individuals and businesses um, for their own purposes. Uh, so our digital trade rules, we think, can help a little bit to combat digital authoritarianism by introducing binding rules, promoting the free flow of data, as well as ensuring minimum levels of privacy and consumer protection online. And we certainly think this can be supplemented by international dialogue, standards around cybersecurity, what is and is properly needed for the public policy reasons. Um, so I'm just sort of running out of a little bit of time. I could talk about this stuff all day, but just quickly, I want to sort of debunk this myth that, um, you know, uh, in terms of digital trade policy settings, you either have to be um, with us or against us. You either have to be, you know, completely in the pocket of um, Silicon Valley and an advocate for Silicon Valley or, or, you're, or you're part of the problem. Recently at a webinar, I fielded a, a, com a question that how can Australia be a leader in digital trade if you have competition laws that um, that ha have platforms in, in their scope of operation and try to address digital platforms. You know, my rejoinder to that would be that it's impossible now to be a leader in digital trade unless you have strong regulatory protections. And of course, we can discuss how um, onerous and deep they, those, those regulatory platforms and frameworks might be. Um, but I think unless you have strong privacy protections, unless you have a competition law framework where the market power distortions are being addressed, unless you have trust in your consumer base about how um, their data is being used, you're not going to have a sustainable economy where the full benefits of, of those services are being utilised and certainly not over the longer term. Um, so that's our policy position. I think I'll sort of try and wrap up and hopefully in, in the Q&A we can address um, anything further in terms of that tension between um, having strong rules and the legitimate public policy objectives and the, the way Australia tries to structure our agreements to um, ensure that. Thanks, Nigel. Amy, that was great. Uh, really do appreciate that. Um, some really interesting remarks, uh, two, well, uh, three of which I'll draw out. Uh, I mean, the role of, of digital technology just during COVID in Australia uh, always harks me back to the fact that, like, I grew up in a farm in Outback Australia and our internet connection used to be as dodgy as hell trying to sell our cattle online. 
Um, but the other point you made, I, I really like about the disproportionate impact. Uh, large firms have the resources to adjust and adapt to this type of stuff, but SMEs, it's uh, many of these restrictions essentially mean the market is closed, and that that obviously removes one of the key benefits of the internet as 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 a tool for trade and how it reduces or eliminates the impact of geography on trade. Uh, and then at the myths at the end, in that when we're talking about data flows and data governance, we're talking about shared governance. We're not talking about removing regulations. We're talking about moving alongside each other in developing interoperable ways to address uh, issues of shared concern, but doing so in a way with an eye to ensuring that we don't obviously undermine the potential use of data and digital technology. So all really great points. I, 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 I love that that, those set of remarks. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sada-san, who will be able to provide us with an overview of how Japan has been engaging on these issues globally. Sada. Sure, thank you, Nigel. And thank you so much for great insights from my peer speakers. I'm so excited to be a part of this panel. So I'm Sada Ito, the former Chief Director of Information Policy Bureau within Japanese METI. And in 2019, I was personally in charge of the digital portion of G20 Osaka Leaders Summit when the former Prime Minister Abe uh, floated the idea of data free flow with trust. And I'm now stationed in New York covering geotech issues. And what I want to do today is to use some slides and to kind of compile what has been discussed so far into one angle to get a better view. So please allow certain overlaps with the other speakers' observation. And let me try uh, screen share. I hope you can see my slide. So I should start with this. Now, so as Nigel stipulated, global economy is driven by data and this arena with free flow of data is critical infrastructure of economic growth and social prosperity. However, there are certain signs of certain countries taking advantage of unshielded free flow of data. And we are seeing the increasing rise of digital protectionism as we see comprehensive illustration in the, uh, the latest IDIF report. So free flow is not for free. We have to make every effort to ensure trust. And that is exactly why former Prime Minister Abe floated the idea of data free flow with trust, DFFT, at G20 Osaka in 2019. Actually, Osaka was phenomenal because it was essentially the first occasion when the world leaders discussed global digital governance issue as their major agenda. And since then, DFFT has functioned as a key driver to ensure global digital governance and interoperability among respective frameworks. So two key messages at G20 Osaka were, one, data free flow with trust, and two, human-centric AI. So simply put, digital technology and data should be used to solve social issues and to help people, not to control or suppress people. And multi-layered approach has been pursued to follow up this DFFT, some in trade arena, notably under WTO e-commerce negotiations, and in other related but different arena, such as cybersecurity and export control. As to W2 negotiation, Amy has already laid out the total picture, and it is the most crucial vehicle for incorporating critical mass to ensure world digital growth. And also Japan is aggressively promoting other trade arrangement, which includes digital chapters and disciplines such as prohibition of data localization with US, EU, and UK respectively. There are also like-minded countries' efforts on related issues on cybersecurity frameworks, AI governance, and government access issues. And we are also closely watching ongoing negotiations between Washington and Brussels on data transfer and new privacy seals, which Alex just mentioned. And this pursuit of trustworthiness among partners is not limited to data governance. 
because there is so much integration of cyber software domain and the physical hardware domain now we have to worry about trustworthiness of wide-ranged issues from 5g semiconductor supply chain submarine cable to ai and data so there are now various floating idea to deepen technology and coordination among like-minded countries both to protect technology and to promote technological innovation And in this context, I will mention just three. One, Suga Biden bilateral summit in April spent considerable portion of time on these tech issues. And two, Quad Tech Working Group has been established and is aggressively discussing common challenges toward in-person leaders meeting, which is supposed to be held by the end of this year. And most recently and importantly, as Minister Whittingdale stressed at the outset, G7 hosted by UK addressed digital issues, including the FFT world map, and also agreed upon establishment of future tech forum among G7 partners. We are confident that this future tech forum is a perfect vehicle for democratic alliance on global data governance. So these efforts along with Transatlantic Trade and Tech Council are expected to contribute to policy coordination among allies and to come up with common ground of trustworthiness. With that, I will stop and thank you and back to you, Nigel. Thank you, Sato-san. So I appreciate the overview of everything Japan's trying to do in, in, in uh, uh, sort of articulating and prosecuting uh, sort of this issue on 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 the global agenda and the global stage and and i mean as you outlined there uh, i i i really do credit japan with being creative and trying to figure out uh every forum where it can try and sort of advocate for new digital and cyber rules uh, around the world in trying to figure out how to make progress there and so with that uh that concludes our remarks here and we'll shift it to q a um, uh, again, I encourage everyone to send through questions through the ITIF event page or on YouTube and uh, I'll, I'll sort of be moderating the discussion um, and, and sending them on and, and, and seeing where we go with that. But with that, this was uh, sort of inevitable, Alex, uh, in that um, people are obviously really interested to hear any further details you can provide about how things are going with the EU in regards to privacy shield negotiations, um, both in terms of time frame, but I suppose are you able to give us any any indication about sort of the the key sort of uh, sticking points that that you're working with your EU counterpart parts on in trying to, as you said, sort of uh, create a uh, an agreement that's also durable in the long term. Yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit more about sort of. Um, I mean, it's very much like, you know, tied to the actual sort of Schrems to decision itself. And so certainly that's something that sort of we and our partners in the commission have been doing is sort of giving that a close reading. And I mean, I think you can sort of describe it as looking at almost sort of two buckets of issues. You have sort of questions around sort of necessity and proportionality of um, access to data. And then also, I mean, then there's the question of redress. And sort of both of these topics have been, um, I guess I'd say like you know, evolving over time. And that's another thing I like to think about with this is that it's almost sort of look at it as an iterative process because certainly you had the Schrems one case and then we had to sort of work on that to come up with certain things in the privacy shield framework that uh, could address the court's concerns. Um, but some of those things were pre-existing. I mean, for instance, PBD 28 predated sort of the Schrems 1 decision. Um, and so now sort of we're able to look and work with our European partners on finding solutions um, in full light of sort of like this decision. But also there has been sort of additional jurisprudence in Europe on this with some cases regarding member state government access to data that has also provided additional information. And you also have sort of more um, interpretation from the European Data Protection Board 
on sort of they have this document about the European essential guarantees, which has also been very informative and helps us sort of um, figure out what it is that we need to put in place here to um, meet sort of the legal standards laid out by their court. I mean, again, I can't sort of say like a timeline, but we certainly are working on this um, as a matter of priority and want to get something put in place as quickly as possible. But it also has to be a um, strong agreement that sort of meets um, the legal standards. And I, and just in terms of that, I, uh, in terms of what a final sort of successor agreement looks like, I'm presuming it would largely, it would be most likely to be uh, executive order related rather than anything legislative. Yeah, I mean, I think we're very much focused on sort of non-legislative um, options here because a, we want to be able to move as quickly as possible. And then B, like I know there actually is some, like, you know, the um, jurisprudence out there indicates that sort of um, executive sort of action should be like, you know, sufficient for sort of uh, putting in place the uh, mechanisms that would be necessary. Uh, and then also sort of, we certainly are like, you know, there's a shared recognition that um, the current status quo of instability in the data transfer relationship is not, um, uh, tenable and sort of certainly we are hearing sort of the voices from industry in the United States, but also uh, European companies as well who are concerned about sort of um, that this is going to be impacting their ability to do business in the United States as well. Yeah, no, and that's a, a point I'm always cognizant on is that uh, the longer the vacuum of uncertainty continues, uh, the more this the, the impact becomes sort of uh, goes from being indirect or de facto to being explicit because firms just want certainty in terms of what they need to do to be in compliance and to, to manage data as, as part of global operations. And in the absence of that certainty, um, they obviously face some very real large fines. So um, the lot and the longer that the vacuum continues, the more we have these decisions from individual data protection agencies sort of questioning or scrutinizing um, data services that connect to the United States. So, um, but I appreciate the, the work that you and your colleagues are doing, given the ground shifts underneath you as you try and figure out uh, what to build on top of it uh, in, in the near term, uh, in recognizing that obviously business continues to take place and, and, and try and adjust. Yeah, um, and sort of in that, uh, oh, pardon. No, please. And just sort of in that environment, I mean, we've tried to sort of do what we can to sort of facilitate companies continuing to use the standard contractual clauses uh, for their data transfers during this um, sort of period of uncertainty as we work to negotiate an enhanced privacy shield framework. But we also sort of recognize that um, that's not a uh, silver bullet solution and that there's still a great deal of question marks around sort of companies um, ability to use the like you know, SCCs and other methods for transfer and that that's been sort of brought up in other cases and that that's um, that ultimately um, the SHREMS 2 decision focused solely on government access to data and so the commercial aspects of Privacy Shield I mean remain um, the protections that it offers are like you know remain strong and uh, are enforceable and um, but there needs to be sort of an agreement between governments about sort of the um, government access to data issues. And that's what we're working on right now. And that will also provide um, certainty for transfers under other mechanisms, um, such as the SCCs and binding corporate rules, because we would extend sort of as we did with Privacy Shield, uh, the national security commitments to cover all data transfers. Yeah, no, um, I, that's uh, so many different parts to what you're trying to deal with. Um, I'll use uh, the, the, uh, the I'll take the moderator's prerogative to ask the next question just because it's been uh, a focus of discussion in recent days. Uh, but I wanted to ask Amy, um, there's been recent reports about uh, the US considering sort of re-engaging in a, a digital trade agreement in the Asia Pacific. Uh, obviously, it's been um, sort of absent from some of the bigger initiatives uh, for a little while besides sort of uh, bilateral agreements. I just wanted to get your your reaction on on the state of play uh, as, as uh, Australia and your counterparts in Singapore and elsewhere sort of see the evolving architecture in the region and why you think it would, what, what role or, or what interest do you think the US uh, should see in what you're doing 
And what reaction do you think there'd be in the region to, to greater US involvement on, on setting digital trade rules? Yeah, thanks, Nigel. Um, so, you know, as you sort of pointed out in your remarks, Australia is, is taking a leadership role on digital trade, including in our region, um, through things like the Australia Singapore DEA and through driving um, as co convener the e commerce JSI and the WTO. Um, most recently, Australia and the UK agreed in principle on ambitious digital rules um, that will increase opportunities for digital trade bilaterally. Um, so, you know, obviously we're open to further discussions about the future of digital trade rules with like-minded countries. I mean, I will note that it wouldn't be a first for the US to start engaging in these issues. Obviously, they have an, a digital agreement with Japan. Um, you know, so regardless of sort of formal trade rules, the US has still been very engaged and is um, very constructively um, helping us in the WTO as well. Um, but yeah, we would welcome, you know, discussions with like-minded um, on, you know, future trade rules that would um, progress our shared interest in an open, inclusive digital trade environment. Uh, I think we share a lot, um, as does Japan and Singapore, we share a lot of um, interest with the US and a lot of policy goals. And, and I, as I sort of said in some of my remarks, I'm seeing that in the WTO actually more broadly on data. Um, you know, much, it's, it's a very different conversation to a few years ago when there was sort of an existential crisis of we couldn't possibly have data rules. You know, I think RCEP um, has shifted that conversation with China and some LDC and DCs taking on data rules. And now it's a discussion about what would the data rules look like? What exceptions will they have? Um, so it, it, it has shifted slightly. And I think um, the US has been crucial um, in the WTO and elsewhere promoting strong digital trade rules. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting point. And it relates, uh, I'm not quite sure whether you're already addressing one of the other questions in the chat about uh, the role of the WTO in setting new rules and how members, the, the, the joint statement initiative for e-commerce, how countries' approach to the issue has, has changed over time. I, so I just, you've obviously, Australia's uh, been leading the charge with its digital economy agreement with Singapore in terms of like setting sort of the gold standard um, and involved in RCEP and elsewhere. How do you, how, what role do you think the, the, the WTO sort of talks best play? Like what's, how does it fit into the, the, the puzzle? Yeah, thanks. That's a $50,000 question. I mean, as a, a long time trade negotiator, obviously I have optimism in my coffee every morning. Um, but look, I think we, we've come a long way in the WTO discussions. I was also Australia's lead digital negotiator for the RCEP agreement. And as I mentioned, that was a much more difficult discussion. Um, it was the first time China had ever agreed trade rules, uh, data, trade rules on data that are in the TPP model, although the exceptions are broader. Um, and so I think going into the WTO with that under our belt, obviously the e-commerce JSI is the only one, the only plurilateral discussion in the WTO that has all the major players, um, you know, EU, China, the US, um, Brazil already engaging constructively and in detailed negotiations. At the start of our WTO negotiations, it was more on principles. Um, you know, we're now having detailed plenary dis discussions as is um, available on the WTO website, um, updates on detailed plenary discussions on data and also small group discussions. So look, I'm really positive about the role that the WTO can play in terms of where that, sit, you know, where the um, level of ambition will sit compared to the Singapore DEA, compared to RCEP. You know, obviously Australia as a co-convener um, is supportive of the Davos statement that the JSI be a high ambition, high quality agreement. And because it's a plurilateral, we think that is achievable. Um, so we are aiming for a standard that is more ambitious than RCEP. Um, but of course there are 86, you know, participants. And so we're conscious of that as well. And we're also conscious um, as always in the WTO of the needs of developing countries and LDCs. Um, but as I said, I, all I can say is that the discussions are actually really constructive and have moved on a lot more. Um, and I think there is a, I think I can say that there's a general recognition that, that data rules are an important part of the digital trade package and of any digital trade package. And then it's, what, it's about what that looks like and the detail of that. Uh, that's all really useful and, and super interesting to give everyone an idea of like, the nature of discussions of, of what's taking place at the WTO, which which is like the broadest membership. So it's like that's it's it's naturally going to be the toughest. But I am glad that you have uh, hope in your coffee every morning because otherwise I'm I'm sure 
you the, the the nature of your day to day job would be very different without it. So, um, uh, and with that, I note this other uh, question from a friend of mine, Mike Nelson from the Carnegie Endowment in the chat. I'll just quickly take the the moderator's prerogative to answer. Mike asked whether the Russian government has a law requiring large companies have a local point of contact to respond to violations. Will other countries pass quote unquote hostage laws? I just want to briefly touch on it because it's something I came across increasingly in my research in terms of how countries are basically trying to create a physical presence, uh, make the, the internet uh, from uh, taking it from being intangible to tangible in uh, creating sort of a legal uh, physical presence to target and hold responsible. And that's a really worrying trend because obviously the underlying basis of the internet is that you can connect from, uh, with it from anywhere and you don't necessarily need to have an office there. And so, but it's acting as a huge barrier to uh, potential widespread engagement. And it, it, I know it sends a chill down a lot of firms' uh, spines in that they obviously don't want to put their staff at risk for being held responsible for providing access to data, removing content that the local government deems uh, 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 objectionable or illegal. Uh, and that's hugely problematic and uh, will sort of further lends itself to the sort of fragmentation of the internet in that uh, we're getting to a point where firms have to have not just a, a data center in a, uh, a sort of a data realm, they have to have a physical office as well. And so um, it would just further undermines the nature of uh, the open nature of the internet. Um, but on top of that, uh, I, this, there's a question in here from uh, another Michael that the BRICS countries have coalesced and influenced thinking in South Africa. Uh, how can we confront this, especially the influence of India as a tech leader? And this relates to a question I was going to ask the panel anyway, and I, I open this up to anyone, is it's one thing for Australia and the US and Japan to engage sort of like-minded countries on sort of new ambitious agreements. How do you go about making an impact in those what I call swing states that haven't really made a decision one way or another, or perhaps like India, they're already tilting towards a model of digital control and protectionism. How do you engage with them on trying to get them to see uh, why data localization and other restrictions aren't the right path ahead and that there's a better path for them to work with, with Japan, the United States and Australia? How do you go about uh, uh, making changes in those types of countries? Sada? Yeah, I can take that. So now everybody claims that the digital sovereignty or kind of industrial policy uh, with regard to this data arena, it's kind of kind of becoming fashionable. But, you know, so there is no 100% free flow and there is no 100% data control or localization. So unless, unless you are digital autocrat. So we need to draw a fine line, fine balance between free flow and trust. So one good impetus uh, now ongoing is uh, OECD exercise on government access. So we should distinguish the good government access from bad government access. And as I said, so it kind of uh, goes back to more fundamental issues of rule of laws or democracy, those principles. So we have to kind of make that kind of distinction and we can do that. So there's a old Japanese saying, um, daido shoi, meaning that big similarities absorb small differences. So that's exactly what we should do. And so not instead of sticking to the small differences, I think we should uh, properly address what's at stake. That's a good point. Uh, Amy, Alex? It's hard to um, add to that. That was very eloquent explanation. I mean, you know, just to say, I think you, um, I think it was you, Nigel, that said earlier in terms of all the, the tools in our toolkit, um, you know, obviously trade rules are one piece, but, you know, as Sadasan mentioned, you know, advocacy and dialogue, the work we're doing in international bodies, international standards, norm setting, all of that will be, you know, I think crucial and no one thing will be a silver bullet without that, that full package of our toolkit. Yeah, and this is Alex. I mean, just sort of like one other thing. The, I mean, I think it is important for sort of like you know us and sort of like-minded countries to sort of lead by example, and that is sort of one other thing that we can sort of try to message there is that we got to where we are with sort of like having sort of like you know a 
the digital economy, making significant contributions to economic growth and jobs and innovation through having sort of a thoughtful approach to um, sort of regulation and enabling sort of like data flows. I mean, certainly we have security issues that need to be taken into account there, but that's done in sort of a limited fashion. And I think that sort of is another point that can be made is that sort of they want to reap the benefits of sort of the digital economy and making the case that sort of if they take this heavy handed approach, um, that that would uh, limit sort of the upside for them. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And it sort of relates to the concern I have in my mind in the evolution of data localization going from being sort of a, a whack-a-mole approach and appearing somewhere in that it's increasingly a part of broader uh, conceptual frameworks around industrial development or digital development or cyber sovereignty, which, which are a little, I suppose, squishier to try and get your hands around and try and figure out how do you best sort of like go against uh, responding to that. And that, because that type of uh, conceptualization is increasingly common in India and Europe and elsewhere, that data is something that is to be hoarded and, and stored uh, sort of domestically, uh, which obviously runs counter to uh, the, 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 what we know is true in terms of how firms get the most value out of data. Um, I'll move on. There was an interesting question here um, because it relates to something the minister said uh, what are my own remarks and as well as Amy's remarks, but I just wanted to ask maybe Amy or Sada or even Alex, uh, what sectors or companies do you think are really showing the way in terms of, of articulating or, or advocating for interoperability? Like what are the, where, where do you see interoperability coming to life, I suppose, earliest? Anyone? Uh, I, Alex, I, mean, I can take a stab at it. I mean, sort of certainly like, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to sort of approach interoperability. And I think that sort of certainly um, you do see sort of people in countries coalescing around sort of certain common standards and approaches um, to things. And I think certainly like there's going to be a need for bridging mechanisms because certainly like you know, all data privacy laws aren't going to look the same but I think it's also sort of looking at outcomes. And so Privacy Shield is sort of an example of that, but then you also have sort of the APEC cross-border privacy rules, uh, but then also we're closely watching sort of what the, um, how the GDPR um, codes of conduct um, are implemented sort of, and like whether or not that's another viable route to sort of having um, uh, interoperable transfer mechanisms. And so I think we're going to need sort of all of those things because there's not going to be sort of, I think, a single one way to make it all work. But um, I think it's a matter of everyone trying to work together and um, just keeping that in mind as they put their rules and uh, in place. Yeah, no, I agree. Like it's it's it, it comes from everywhere. Um, and I'll be especially interested to see the UK's forthcoming adequacy determinations and contractual guidance and stuff like that as they themselves try and define their own uh, interoperable toolbox. Uh, Sadasan, sorry, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, just one example I would like to add is uh, specifically a specific sector is healthcare. So under this, you know, COVID crisis, uh, a lot of a lot of countries and a lot of governments uh, has made an endeavor to uh, kind of a, tackle on this the balance between the uh, like tracing of infections and uh, how they deal with privacy and uh it's kind of mixed mixed outcome so we really have to kind of you know look back what has happened during this one year and a half and uh how we should kind of formulate the this discipline among how we'll deal with trust and how we can kind of implement uh those uh goods into the, uh, the implementation uh, so that the people uh, can make a better life. Nigel, I think you're muted. My apologies. Uh, all good points. Uh, uh, 
I just want to draw one question out of the chat and then I'll throw another one out. I just wanted to specifically raise it uh, from Jonathan Cave on uh, does data localization inhibit or encourage a free flow of processing of artifacts of data like synthetic data or trained algorithms? Uh, just a brief mention, one thing that I came through with my research, uh, one of the main reasons localization is so uh, detrimental is that if it touches a, uh, if it has, if one part of a, a, a data element contains a restricted form of data, uh, the cost and complexity of a firm to differentiate that from the rest of the data as a, and from the rest of the data set is extraordinarily hard to do. And so that's why many firms who I've spoken to when they talk about localization, even though a measure may only be specifically targeted at one type, it's very difficult often for them to disaggregate that from all the other areas that they use data and how it's all combined together. So it can have a much broader effect beyond that, which it specifically targets. Um, uh, the other question I wanted to throw out there, and maybe uh, uh, Amy's the best one for this, it's a, a very trade law question in terms of for effective future digital trade, we'll need a robust digital uh, dispute resolution mechanism. Is there any focus on this? Um, how, what's your experience been thus far, Amy, with uh, how Australia has done with uh, 14 of its 16 FTAs, including digital components? What's the thinking there? Yeah, thanks. It's a really good question. Um, you know, the short answer is we haven't had disputes on our core digital trade rules on any of our FTAs yet, really. Um, there are, of course, disputes on issues that relate to them and, you know, some certain the way we um, interpret certain exceptions and general exceptions and that type of thing. But um, no, we haven't we haven't directly tested these rules. Um, we do have an eye to that um, with the exception, you know, so so, you know, Australia's principle is that they should be subject to dispute settlement and we craft them as such and we negotiate them as such. Um, unfortunately, in RCEP, even though in the room, everyone was negotiating the rule as though dispute settlement was would apply, um, you will notice that the this CS doesn't apply to the to the data rules in RCEP. We are, of course, in the WTO, hopeful of an outcome um, in which the rules are disputable. And, and then, of course, that ties into the question of the future of WTO dispute settlement, um, on which Australia is also very hopeful that we can um, you know, work with like-minded to get progress there and, um, and restore the, the function of the WTO dispute settlement process, we think it's you know fundamental to global to global trade. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but it, it's something that we definitely keep a keen eye on. Yeah, no, I think I think given how new the, music again, yeah. yeah, I think given how new the rules are, it's understandable. But what matters is that they're a part of the equation from the start, because for the rules to be meaningful, they need to be enforceable. So. Um, so that's a, a, a key part of the equation. Um, the other question I wanted to draw on uh, one other question we had in the chat, which sort of relates, I'll, I'll sort of um, extrapolate in terms of how do you reply to the idea that localization is needed not to protect privacy of data, but ensure the government has jurisdiction to deal with violations. And I'll use that to segue to ask about the debate on government access to data at the G7 and, and OECD. Um, Alex, given your long history involved in uh, EU-US issues, I suppose it's sort of surprising that, it, that it's taken this long for there to be a broader specific discussion uh, around uh, creating sort of norms and principles around government access to data. Um, how would you respond to that point, that, that facet of, 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 of data localization, how policymakers justify it? And, and can you give us a general idea of of how the talks at the OECD and G7 are going. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think the like, you know, I mean, yeah, you do have sort of these two threads of um, justifications for sort of data localization. You have sort of the idea that the data will be more private and secure and protected if it's in the home country. Um, but that's a little bit sort of like, you know, uh, not doesn't really sort of hold water because I mean it's more about sort of the uh, protections and sort of the systems that are in place for sort of protection of the data and your cybersecurity and all of those things and how the data is used and handled that sort of drives that and you can do that sort of anywhere. I mean the other question is sort of the um, as you said sort of this uh, we need to have a copy of the data in country in order to make sure that um, the government has access to it for sort of 
legal purposes or for compliance or things of that sort. Um, but I mean, this is something that I think that seems like a fairly blunt um, solution to sort of a limited sort of edge case problem. And certainly there are sort of like, you know, difficulties with sort of the uh, MLAT, the multilateral legal assistance treaty process, and sort of there's things that we are trying to do in that space to sort of um, as well with the Cloud Act. Um, but I think that sort of that's the impact of data localization on limiting the choice of sort of companies to use sort of services of their choice and the negative impacts of uh, putting all your data in sort of one bucket there um, for cybersecurity and other things. I think that kind of is, um, yeah, I mean, should needs to be taken into account as well, sort of when, com when countries are contemplating things of that sort. Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly the OECD process is something that uh, is a helpful multilateral dialogue, such as the OECD can play a important role in sort of bringing um, actual sort of government practitioners to the table to, in a evidence-based and sort of fashion, identify sort of common best practices um, around sort of what we do in a democratic society. And that can help sort of build trust and uh, mutual understanding on this and also sort of limit um, the pressures for um, data localization. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and it's one thing I always note is that um, there will inevitably be some international spillover for some local investigation or, or regulatory oversight, uh, given the nature of the emailing system, banking system, that that uh, localization is no silver bullet. And the only way that countries can uh, sort of address the legitimate underlying concern is to work in cooperation with their, their counterparts and new mechanisms to facilitate access for legitimate concerns. Um, I just wanted to briefly circle back one uh, to Amy's question about, uh, with the question about dispute resolution and the WTO and them being tied together. Uh, and I only just want to raise it as a, the moderator's prerogative uh, in that uh, if there was a, a new and revitalized WTO dispute settlement, I would love to see a wave of data localization related cases to truly test uh, the applicability of, of GATS commitments. Um, but I, that's obviously one of many issues hanging on on the resolution of uh, the discussion around that. Uh, and so um, I realize uh, we're coming uh, towards the end of our time here. And I just uh, briefly uh, wanted to throw it open to the rest of the panelists, whether they had any concluding thoughts or reactions from things we've talked about uh, before we wrap things up. No, 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 no words of, of optimism, of, of, of encouragement, of, of the way ahead that, that, that we will be able to solve all of this. Sada San, do you want to take a shot? Sure. So, I mean, you know, in every like, international or forum, G7, Quad, whatever, this digital governance issues has been uh, uh, the focus of uh, the agenda. And uh, we praise your uh, tremendous efforts to come up with your latest report. And, you know, it really kind of highlights the importance of this issue. And I really enjoyed uh, today's discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, let me sort of echo, like, you know, his sentiments. And also the fact that, like, I, I am optimistic about sort of our ability to figure this out and get to a deal on Privacy Shield and work this out just because what's the alternative? I mean, sort of digital autarky is not sort of uh, really on the table or an acceptable outcome. So we really do need to sort of do the work of, um, yeah, sitting down and negotiating sort of things that work for sort of like in the various countries involved and uh, enable um, the digital economy to sort of continue because, yeah, I mean, it's people are not going to accept it, a world in which they can't transfer data and use services of their choice and uh, where all this doesn't work. So I like the optimism. Amy, any, any final words? Yeah, look, and I just want to echo the other presenters in saying that this, I think your report will really help us in our advocacy. It's concrete um, explanations like this that we can take, um, you know, in our policy dialogue in the international forum, but also in the negotiation table. Ultimately, we win those arguments with sort of concrete facts like this about the impact of these types of measures. So I want to thank you for the report and today's session as well. 
No, I, I, I appreciate the, the kind feedback. Sometimes working in a think tank, you can publish something and it feels like it disappears into a black hole. So I appreciate the feedback. But with that, I want to thank all of our speakers. Uh, uh, I really do appreciate you taking the time to speak. I also want to thank uh, the minister for taking the time to pre-record the keynote remarks. I thought they were a really great contribution to today's debate. I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, really appreciate all the questions. Uh, and uh, again, thank you to our panelists and thanks for tuning in today.